Hi all, let's have a look at uh, another amazing game from round 9, Mamdaryov playing white against Levon Aronian. The round before, Mamdaryov had a bad accident game against Vladimir Kramnik, where technically he was winning, he needed to play precisely, and then ended up losing. It was quite tragic. So could Mamdaryov pick himself up for this round against the number 2 in the world? It would seem a very big ask to do this. But he did have the white pieces. He kicked off with d4. Levon chose knight f6 and played into a Nimzo engine defense. White actually entertained the Nimzo engine by playing knight c3 here as opposed to knight f3, queen's engine territory. So knight c3, bishop b4. And now a little bit of a rare move, but it has been used to successfully defeat uh, even Magnus Carlsen. Uh, an Olympiad once, and also Magnus Carlsen used it himself, this F3 move here, in the recent World Championship uh, last year against Fishy Anand, I believe. So F3 is the fourth most popular move in live book. The most popular continuation is the Rubenstein variation E3. Queen C2, one of Kaspar's favourite moves, Knight F3, then we have F3. So a very interesting idea, F3. Black castled. White played e4. Now up to d5. White continues with e5. So a very interesting position here from this opening. Knight fd7. Now white takes on d5. After e takes, white continues here with a3. Bishop takes c3. Black gives up the bishop pair here. Uh, if I think retreating the bishop has been played once before, but the usual move is to take here 24 games in live book. B takes. Now the usual move is played, which is f6. And white now usually just takes on f6, which he did. And black just often just takes on f6 in return. There's 16 games here in live book with queen takes f6. Uh, for example, let's let's show this this kind of continuation is interesting. Where, okay, chances for both sides. Uh, white has got weakened light squares, particularly c4, but um, and also this this dynamic pressure. But it's kind of quite solid for white, so does it actually mean anything there? Uh, but uh, it's about equal this position, or even black's doing quite well from an engine perspective. Uh, but Levin actually played. Uh, another interesting move here instead, which has been seen before once in live book 2007. Uh, I have queen e8 check. And after queen e2, the idea is queen f7. And it looks like uh, this, this is quite nifty because black wants to arrange rook e8 with huge pressure potentially against white's king. White dares take on g7 and accepts this situation. So after rook e8, bishop e3, this looks as though black has very dangerous threats emerging here after knight c6, in particularly in this c4 square. So knight a5 and this knight b6, these knights are heading for c4 to attack e3. This, these vultures here would be descending like this <laughs> via the c4 square. So what does white do here? A very calm move, very accurate move in this position, and I think uh, beginners of the game are going to be outraged that White's not developing pieces. It seems, but there's very immediate requirements here about the c4 square and these horrible knights descending for e3. White actually played, believe it or not, queen d2, just unleashing the bishop to be able to protect that c4 square. That's the emergency. Uh, crisis that White's faced this c4 square, knight a5, and again against this c4 square. This next move, rook b1. White is even prepared to sacrifice the exchange now to fend off these knights. Knight b6, rook b4. You might think, well, why is White doing this to himself? Well, he has actually damaged Black's king safety theoretically. There's an kind of isolated pawn here, and if this pawn's ever taken, then it will expose Black's king. So for the moment, the pawn acts as um, a kind of foreign visitor pawn to help defend Black's king instead of his own pawn. It's a very unusual position, this, where there's a pawn on g7, a white pawn on g7. But um, yeah, so knight ac4, 
and white plays bishop takes c4 and here i mean you'd think black could win the exchange immediately force force white to sack the exchange with knight takes c4 uh, but he didn't do that actually but um actually before we check this out there's also bishop f5 as well to consider that would have been interesting as well to maybe delay knight a c4 so there's a few options for black to intensify the pressure on e3 here but anyway so knight a c4 was played bishop takes now level one, instead of knight takes c4 he played d takes c4 this kind of position knight takes rook takes d takes is technically apparently slightly better for black uh, let's look at say king f2 bishop f5 but white okay he's the exchange down but if he can get this bishop going with for example bishop f4 to e5 later it's going to be worth quite a lot um, and, and black's king could be under scrutiny this knight could actually have very dangerous squares available later as well so it's it's, it's not entirely clear it's a complicated position the exchange down and for pawns it's um three four five three four five six seven two pawns uh for the exchange okay one when that's taken but when it's taken black's king will be more weakened okay i mean it's it's an interesting continuation but um d takes c4 creates knight d5 as the new emergency and that's dealt with with rook b5 so again prepare to sacrifice the exchange on d5 this isn't immediately played though levon plays bishop f5 first now after king f2 he does play it now knight d5 but it seems technically from an engine perspective white is actually slightly better here and doesn't even have to sacrifice the exchange apparently apparently here bishop f4 believe it or not at a certain depth 20 seems playable it seems to offer white a technical advantage bishop f4 uh, what's the idea well the idea of the bishop d3 because this this looks to be severely dangerous for white that he can't move the knight without rook e2 the idea is to play bishop e5 and this is actually better for white now in theory um, so anyway so bishop f4 wasn't played white actually willingly he had the option he didn't have to do this he willingly sacked the exchange here leaving black technically fractionally better there's nothing really much in it after knight e2 the king um, has been neglected a bit with the queen over here which is subject to a tempo gain as well in some lines so this doesn't seem as good as before for black to be the exchange up it seems a bit more favorable here for white with now things like knight f4 maybe g4 giving the h5 square for the knight so this this could be a very very dangerous knight coming in on the dark squares in conjunction with potentially bishop f4 to e5 if that's prepared enough now Levin plays for queenside counterplay he plays a5 and his idea is to crash through a rook with b4 and, and activate this rook down this file which could be very very useful and dangerous in theory I'm not sure it's entirely theoretically the best idea if we just put that back for a moment and look at rook a d8 the thing is okay rook a d8 what is black's intention with rook a d8 um let's let's run through say knight f4 queen f7 rook d1 queen let's take this pawn the thing is white once he gets in d5 he gets that d4 square for the bishop and again you know this isn't so clear this is it's just not so clear this knight is away from the color of that bishop so it can be on f4 for quite some while um say bishop g6 a4 it's a complicated position it's really it's, it's a different game but this is this looks like very good play for both sides white white uh, white's bishop is very very impressive here i mean it's to do with you know black's not not so shielded with his king so it makes actually white's pieces more dangerous than usual so anyway levon's plan of playing for this a5 to try and break open the queen side is, is interesting h4 looks as though it's got the idea of simply protecting the pawn if black's not going to take it refusing to take it 
and then that will be quite dangerous for later maybe a knight coming to f6 later if black did take the pawn here immediately white apparently does well with bishop f4 for example bishop d3 bishop e5 check this is dangerous now if it's not taken then this actually gets to be much better for white uh, well we can take here as well if it is taken counter exchange sack the knight f4 is very useful here to insert and this position uh, should be okay for white that e fold actually looks quite painful for black potentially this this is better for white so okay black doesn't really want to take the pawn here uh, so he carries on with his plan b5 trying to break open this rook down that a file h5 white carries on with his plan b4 white takes time to do something about b4 here well he takes c takes b4 a takes a takes okay blacks lost that pawn but generated scope for his rook and now plays queen b5 white has to be wondering okay can he um, survive this pressure with things like rook a3 on the cards bishop d3 uh, these all look pretty dangerous he plays actually rook e1 knowing that the energy if, if this rook comes down then this e file is kind of neglected it would be nice if white can challenge the e file in counter response bishop d3 knight f4 and white is actually doing quite well now actually um, after knight f4 with d5 on the cards and bishop d4 this would be a beautiful central bishop and challenging that e file would be very unpleasant indeed uh, for white rook a3 is played now as though there's an echo of pressure on on e3 or maybe just to play queen a4 and rook a2 that's another idea or just to double rooks like this for, for rook a2 white now plays d5 so he's creating possibilities like bishop d4 the dynamism of white's pieces has just been improved dramatically after d5 believe it or not white stands very well technically now the engine rates white's position as like one and a half extra 1.5 uh, this does look as though this is backfiring this this rook coming here it's losing a quite critical time uh, white's bishop d4 looks like a menacing move to have to face along with this e file now protecting the pawn and black's king safety is getting a bit suspect levon plays bishop b1 so bishop b1 carries with it ideas like rook a2 uh, but it's just an immediate threat which can be uh, quite well uh, parried with this next move played which is just get the king out of there with king g3 Another move is also Queen D4 here, which is which is good as well. Apparently, uh, the King's still going to come to G3 if Rook A2, King G3. So the King goes there in, in, in advance anyway. King G3. So what's Black's Rook doing here on A3? White now has horrible things on the cards, including Bishop C5, H6, um, or just Queen C1. It's dangerous as well for h6 later. It's all pretty dangerous now for black's king. Uh, Levon tries c3 in this very complicated position. White plays queen c1, <clears throat> attacking the rook and the bishop. So they protect each other with rook b3. It just seems a little bit awkward where, uh, where black's pieces are <clears throat> in relation to his king. And there's a backfire here now. Bishop c5 down this e file. It looks as though black has been compromised. His king has actually been compromised with his pieces just away from the king um, at a simple level looking at this position. In fact, you know, we can demonstrate king safety, I think. If we just move the rook just to demonstrate king safety, the rook wasn't moved. Uh, but knight e6 carries things uh, like queen f4. Queen f8, huge threats like this are emerging. This pawn is not black's pawn, and it's going to show it soon. Right? It's going to show it quite dramatically if given a chance. So Levon played rook takes 
uh, e1 here. Queen takes e1, and there's a threat of mate in free with queen e6 check here. If it takes h6, there's a mate in free with bishop d4 to follow. Black has to defend that. Queen d7. Now here, there's an absolutely crushing move. We're talking plus 10 on the engine. It's got more than plus 10. It's it's virtually winning. Now it's plus 15, depth 18. It's, a, it's an absolute crushing move. I wonder if what you would play here. It's it's a real bone crusher move. There was an earlier dream of getting a knight to f6. That's the clue. What would you play here if I gave you 10 seconds starting from now? You might want to pause the video. Okay, this wasn't played, but it's a bone crushing move, d6. What it means, it vacates d5, so say c takes, we just play. <clears throat> In this position, I think knight d5 immediately doesn't work, actually, so it's not so easy as that because the queen takes g7. But the d5 square has been vacated, meaning that bishop d4 taking care of that issue still means knight d5 is on the cards. And now uh, this is big trouble. If d5, then uh, we can even just play knight takes d5 here. Uh, this, this, this is just all over for black. It's a forced mate. If check, uh, king h4 will get out of the checks. And then black is faced with all sorts of nasties like queen e8. Uh, so that, that would just be over. The game would just be over. Uh, what, is, what does black actually do here in this position? This, this is just totally winning position, just in the middle game. Uh, just protecting this pawn with these huge, huge threats. In particular, knight, knight d5. If rook takes b4, we still play knight d5 because we've got that knight f6 on the card now. Or knight e7 is very dangerous mating. So if this is taken, we just play knight f6 and we take the queen. Anyway, it was a bit of a let off, it seemed, uh, that this this wasn't played. d6 was not played here. It's a beautiful move. Um, I, I guess you might think, well, what about the immediate queen takes g7? I mean, that is check. I don't think it helps. King h2. If c takes here, check. Queen takes d6. And white is threatening queen d8, check. And then the horrible stuff like bishop d4 or knight e6 is going to be decisive here. Say, hmm, say we give black a move back bishop c2 just to demonstrate. Knight e6, queen f8. So black's king safety has just been totally compromised, but um, okay, it's enough of that. H6 was played, which is still uh, a very, very good move, securing the pawn. White's still got a huge advantage with this continuation, gigantic advantage. Just black's pieces just are in the wrong place. This pawn is not queening or anything because black's king is going to get slaughtered. If the pawn like moves, for example, then knight h5 now. Because that's another thing. H5 offers knight H5 to F6. What do we do here? What does Black potentially do here? If Queen F7, Knight F6 check is good. Just force the mate like this. So mating on yeah. Queen F8, Queen F8. So Black is in big, big trouble after H6 as well. He played actually Queen F7 and another knockout blow sort of move. From an engine point of view, but as I say, you know this endpoint theory video uh, recently on the channel shows, in, you know, in human chess, the aim of the game is to win the game. It's not to play the most scientifically amazing moves every turn. It's just interesting, though, in post mortem to check these things out. I think it kind of um, helps our intuition to know this kind of technical stuff. Uh, for me, it's it's rather like, uh, you know, even if you. Did a social science essay. You might have an appendices with um, with technical data. You get a feel for the more abstract things. You can back them up evidentially. That you can say Black's king safety ha has been compromised uh, by this whole opening these, these pawns next to his king. 
and we can see these technical moves which just underline all this and here there's a, there's another such technical move in this position white white kind of has a crushing move here the move he played is also you know good as well in its, its own respect uh, but what would you play in this position if I gave you 10 seconds here okay I mean the move the engines come up with is Queen e5 and I think this does does support basically Knight h5 again it renews renews the idea of Knight h5 it wasn't played but it's, it's really quite uh, devastating for black uh, if Bishop f5 okay that does shield Knight h5 uh, or does it in fact even in this position Knight h5 is possible Queen takes Queen e7 is, is mating the check it's just temporary inconvenience check the king can come here apparently and then uh, black's running out of checks has to resort to rookie two yeah this this queen uh, f8 here if queen g7 queen e8 mating but anyway yeah so there's knockout blows that have been missed and this is the second one queen e5 with the major threat of knight h5 and also another one of d6 as well so yes another kind of let off technically but not really because white's still kind of winning with knight h5 in any case so white's resting now knight f6 and then queen e8 black played bishop g6 and here white plays this beautiful looking move queen e8 here it's good enough this continuation after takes now it takes there so the king can't take because of g8 queening rook comes back um, and now white plays knight f6 so forcing black to play rook a8 queens taking the rook off getting this ending which is actually winning for white and it reminds me of an earlier round I'm, I'm sorry of uh, where he's he's got these dangerous pawns on both sides of the board opposite color bishops but the king is is more active than black's king so this is this is winning as well this is endpoint theory we can we can get away with this shortcutting of of not playing the most optimal moves because on the endpoint theory you're climbing the mountain it doesn't matter if you take 10 days to climb the mountain or you climb the mountain in in half an hour if you climb the mountain it's like winning the game we can win the game at our own pace we're not aiming to play the scientifically best moves each turn this is a winning position still after king e5 king f7 bishop e3 this pawn is going nowhere and white's going to create a pass pawn here eventually with d6 and this bishop like like in Mamadora's other game, it's strange, strangely, strangely reminiscent. It's not only defending against Black's pawn, it's protecting the pawn here. After Bishop F1, G4, Levon was convinced he was lost here, and actually resigned. Uh, like Pitt Vidler was convinced he was lost and, and resigned without playing on. Uh, let's let's play some scenarios out. So Black resigned here, even with this humble continuation from White. So say Bishop E2. We can work slowly here. We don't have to lose any pawn with f4. We can just put the king back for a moment. G5. Let's just run for an example. F4. So we protect. Make sure the pawns are protected. Then we can start working on d6. If we play for d6, we create this pass pawn here, and this should be trivially um, winning, actually. And to be honest, I mean, I I couldn't believe uh, the official commentators uh, at the time. I just couldn't believe what I was hearing as, as though they were a bit surprised this as though this wasn't winning of course this is winning because of this past pawn the king is going to hurt the pawn this is trivially winning now you just reach this scenario and this is trivially winning I know it's opposite colored bishops but black's pawn is not going anywhere I think 
they must must have been exhausted the commentators as well i i just think in the cold light of day how is black actually doing anything here it's it's totally lost we we can run through this again what what is black actually doing against this pawn nothing he's just going to get overloaded so this is an absolutely winning continuation played as well it's it's he didn't need all all these uh, special special moves like queen e5 and stuff or or d6 here uh what he played was strong enough this continuation that he played a fantastic game from Mamadarov. Aronian just felt completely lost i think this was just far too complex uh for him to, to factor in uh, the exchange sacrifice with the pawn on g7 it's just very unusual uh, circumstances uh, for for black to face. I think it it, it helped the, the exchange down with this bishop. This dark square bishop is like not being an exchange down because because black's king was was always seemingly in a bit of trouble in many variations. Very very complex game uh, indeed. And what it meant was that um, Vichy Anand took a full point lead because Levon was the closest rival. So after round nine, uh, with Levon losing and Vichy winning, Vichy was a full point ahead now uh, with the rest day. Amazing stuff, amazing turn of events. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.